morning. Good morning. Good morning. For a minute, I thought you were clapping for me when I came out. <laughs> we have been fortunate in the province of Ontario to have exceptional, exceptional leadership. Since 2003, uh, we've had Kathleen working for us, working in a number of different responsibilities, different ministries, and her dedication to Ontario extends to all of us, whether it be housing issues, whether it be uh, uh, issues that affect every one of us in the communities, uh, wages, so many important issues, complex issues, that quite frankly, only strong leadership would, would tackle. So we're really, really fortunate to have our Premier with us here today. And without any further ado, please join me in welcoming the Premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne. Oh. Does it matter? Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, all of you, for being here. It's, uh, it's great to be in Hamilton, Your Worship, thank you very much for being here. I'm joined by my colleagues, Minister Helena Jasek, Minister Chris Ballard, Ballard, and our philosopher king, the man in Hamilton, Ted McMeekin. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. And let me just say, this is not the movie set. So if you've come in here, this is not the movie set. That's in the next room. And I want to, I don't know, Joe, whether it was you who arranged this morning. Oh, my goodness. I had a little bit of Hamilton Awesome. I was down at the waterfront park, and I ran around. The sun was shining on the other side. Hello, Dylan. Good to see you. Um, the, uh, the sun was shining, and there were red-winged blackbirds doing some kind of ritual. There were skulls out on the, the water. There was a go train in the distance. And I saw a beaver. Okay, a beaver, right, on the little side water. So it was, uh, it was awesome. So thank you, whoever arranged that. It was uh, <laughs> Hamilton awesome. It was terrific. Um, which is, I think, a good segue. I want to I wanna begin my uh, remarks today by showing respect for the contributions of many Indigenous peoples and recognizing the role of treaty making in what is now Ontario and for generations this land has been home to the peoples of Turtle Island and uh, the first treaties were signed long before Confederation so today 150 years later the treaties are still relevant to our lives and I just want to acknowledge that we're uh, gathered on a traditional territory of Indigenous peoples today to have this gathering so thank you. So I spent some time in Ottawa last week. I was at the Carlingwood Mall in the west end of town. I was meeting and uh, talking with people with Bob Shirelli, who's the local MPP. We were in a little food court just across from uh, the Tim Hortons. And it was an older crowd, a lot of seniors from the neighborhood gathering for coffee and conversation. Um, and, you know, um, solving the problems of the world. That's essentially what they were doing. And you can take it from me, very few of them were shy about sharing their opinions. <laughs> I don't think many of them are on Twitter, but uh, they'd fit in just fine. So I was talking to a number of people, and as I moved along the mall, I spotted a, a younger woman sitting alone. And she looked a little down, and uh, she probably wasn't much in the mood to chat, but I went up to her anyway. And it turned out she did want to talk a bit. She had just lost her job. She had lost her job in uh, retail, and she was, uh, she was out of work, and she was in the mall looking for another job. Now, of course, that's not an unusual thing to have happen in a young person's life. 
But what struck me about this conversation was that she was so worried about finding another job. She really seemed kind of lost. She said, everything's up in the air these days. And that is a feeling that a lot of people can relate to. And not only those who are starting out in life. People are anxious about their jobs. They're anxious about their futures. They're worried about the soaring cost of renting or buying a place to live. Many people are concerned about what the world is, hold in, is uh, promising for their kids. It's a world of global competition, reduced benefits, more and more part-time employment. They fear that the future will be less fair to those who don't start out wealthy. And I can tell you, that is different than when I was growing up. There was much more of a sense of optimism when I was uh, in my early 20s, uh, coming out of high school, when I was in my teens. One income used to be enough for most families. And now, even with two people working, it's tough to save, it's tough to feel as though you're getting ahead, and it's tough to feel confident that your job will still be yours or even still be around in 10 years or five years or even less. Je sais que beaucoup ontariens s'inquiètent pour leur emploi et leur avenir. Ils s'inquiètent de la hausse du coût de la vie et de la nature changeante du travail. Et avec tout ce changement et cette incertitude, nous devons travailler pour les protéger de notre mieux. So this is a new world with new challenges. In this new world, our plan to date has been, it's been pretty straightforward. Get the fundamentals right by reducing the deficit, supporting new jobs, focusing on economic growth, and then investing in those priorities that can have the most impact. And what that's meant is that we've made investments in health, in education and infrastructure, new schools, new hospitals, new transit, I say to his worship, roads and bridges. We've been making those investments and we want to make more. I just want to say, we want to make more. We want to invest in, in those pieces of infrastructure. And we've worked to make Ontario the kind of place that attracts investment, that draws people and businesses to it, that creates opportunity and generates good jobs that pay well. The evidence tells us, we look at the numbers, we are making progress. Lower unemployment, more jobs, the best economic growth in the country, and a budget that's coming into balance. So that's a good picture. But it is not the whole picture. There is more to it. There are new forces at play and there are new challenges that are confronting us. So it's one thing to say we're doing better than other provinces or states, which in many cases we absolutely are. It's another to say that everything's fine, because for many, many people, that just isn't true. We're being tested in new and unique ways. Technological progress and automation are creating new industries, but they're also creating new pressures, and they're putting existing jobs at risk. Ontario businesses have never been better at creating wealth. But ensuring those benefits are shared widely and fairly, that seems to be getting more difficult. Then there's the role of trade. And let's face it, the question mark there is the Trump presidency. We know that trade is essential to the economic prosperity of Ontario and of Canada. But in the US, there's a growing instinct to embrace protectionist policies even when the evidence shows that Americans benefit from their trade relationships and agreements with Canada and with Ontario. So, in the midst of this uncertainty, we have to work to support and defend our people as best we can. We must stand up for our farmers, our manufacturers, for companies and workers in the auto industry, the forest industry, and all of those industries that are the backbone of this province. We're entering a new and a very different era. So from technology to Trump, it is a time of greater uncertainty and change. And in that context, I believe that government has a responsibility to respond, to step up, to protect the wages and the well-being of our people by continuing to be bold and active and inventive. Not active for the sake of being active, but active with a clear purpose a clear goal, ensuring fairness, and creating security. 
doing that for right now, but doing that for these guys. That's who we're talking about right here. These guys. We want an Ontario that works now, but works for both these kids when they get older. And I don't even know your names. What's your name? Marley. Marley. Henry. Henry. This is for Marley and Henry. That's who we're doing this for. We must make sure that hard work is rewarded with a decent paycheck. We must make sure that the opportunities available to our people, and especially our young people, that those opportunities not only endure, but that they grow. And the great news is that we're in a good position to do this. Our budget is back in balance. We've spent years building new roads and schools and hospitals and transit. More people are at work in Ontario than ever before. So we're prepared for this moment. We have the freedom and the flexibility to respond to these new challenges. So we must make the right choices now to support the people of Ontario as we navigate this turbulence and set our province on a course toward long-term success. We can't be idle. We can't be complacent. We cannot simply assume that President Trump will do the right thing or make the right choices. We cannot assume that the jobs of tomorrow will automatically be available to Ontarians. Government must have a plan. That's what government exists to do. And to be premier of this province, you must have a plan. Now, there are those who would look at this new world and say that government should just step back, stay out of the way, let the market sort it out. Their idea of a solution is to cut back on public services, reduce taxes, slash regulations on corporations, and then let the results trickle down. Eventually, maybe, in that kind of future, some would do very well, especially those who were already doing pretty well to start out with. But for those who didn't start with an advantage, and for those who are working harder than ever to make ends meet, well, in that scenario, it's tough luck. So that's one path. That is one way to go. But that is not my way, and it will never be. That approach does not speak to my values. It does not speak to the values that we share. The values that say that we believe in fairness and equality of opportunity. It does not address the struggles of people across our province, their frustration at working long hours and still barely getting by. It doesn't speak to the way too many people speak of the years ahead with concern and trepidation rather than with hope. I believe it's the responsibility of government to take a stand, to play a role, and do what it can, do all that it can, to ensure that the people of Ontario are given every chance to thrive and every chance to achieve their potential, especially during this period of change. So my plan, plan our plan, builds on the action that we've taken and the investments that we have made over the past five years. It takes dead aim at the challenges that confront us in this new uncertain world. It puts fairness at the heart of all that we do and all we aspire to achieve for the people of Ontario. Our plan has three main elements. First, we must do more than simply protect people's wages and their ability to earn a good living. We must work to create a fair economy that provides opportunity and security for everyone. And that means helping rural and suburban communities get the support they need just as well as our big city centers. It means affordable housing, rental units, and a real estate market that people can participate in, which is exactly why last week we announced our new fair housing plan, a shout out to our Minister of Housing, Minister Ballard, to make renting or buying a home more affordable in this province. That's the point of our fair housing plan. It means fair workplaces with decent benefits. Workplaces where employers meet their obligations to their workers. And it means good pensions. As a government, we led the way nationally on pension reform. We fought hard for better pensions to ensure that our workers can retire with security. And we never gave up. And together then with the federal government and our provincial colleagues, we got it done. The Improved Canada Pension Plan will pay out more in benefits for a lifetime of hard work. Not for me, but for Marley and Henry.
That's who it'll pay out for. That's who will benefit from the work that our, our government did. And that is the power of government to make a difference when it has a clear plan for the future. The second element of our plan is building a fair future for Ontario workers. An economy where we're creating and attracting the jobs of tomorrow and the investment in industries that go with them. If innovation is going to be the engine of future jobs and growth, then we must cultivate these new industries here in Ontario and draw more innovative businesses to join in what we're building here in the province. We've done the hard work of getting the fundamentals right. Now let's build on that and make a really good thing even better. And third, we have to continue a far-reaching focus on education to give everyone in Ontario a fair start. You know, in our changing world, there is no such thing as a sure thing. But I think we improve our chances of success when more of our people get a good start in life and are able to pursue their education without barrier. And that's why we're creating 100,000 new spaces in childcare. And that's why we're making advanced education more accessible and affordable, so all students have the opportunity to fulfill their dreams. That will make a big difference. Just think about it. This fall, tuition is going to be absolutely free for 210,000 students. Other kids from middle class homes will have much lower levels of student debt. Um, they'll have a better start in their adult lives. And over the next three years, our Career Kickstart program will offer 40,000 more students. <coughs> Sorry, guys. <coughs> that run this morning. <coughs> Do you ever get a tickle in your throat? <clears throat> Just gonna let it calm. <coughs> I just don't want to inhale it and then <coughs> we'll have a different kind of emergency. <laughs> All right, <coughs> it always comes back. It just takes a minute. <coughs> All right, <coughs> so that I was talking about the Kickstart program. 40,000 um, Ontario students will get <coughs> access to a work experience. And what that'll do is it'll give them that first line on their resume. And if you think about that, we're unleashing a huge potential with that kind of investment. It's a potential in our uh, shared future. And think about the anxiety, all those young people, having that anxiety lifted from their shoulders and helping them <coughs> <coughs> to get not just the education, but a good job. So these are the kinds of ideas that we need right now. We need them to be bold and unafraid Ideas that make a meaningful difference in people's lives and in our shared success. Ideas that will actively confront and diminish the uncertainty of this new era. We have a huge opportunity in front of us and we cannot afford to wait. So in the days and the weeks and the months to come, our government will reveal more details of our plan. We'll lay out how these policies will help our people and our province confront the challenges of today and tomorrow. You know, I've been saying to my, uh, my colleagues that we're dealing with all of these anxieties. We're dealing with, uh, as I talked about, the technological anxieties, the anxieties of the, the global economy, the United States. But there's nothing inevitable. There's nothing inevitable about what will or won't happen to Ontario. We can have a huge impact. So just as we did with pension reform, We'll be focused on providing help in areas where employers have withdrawn from their traditional role. We'll be looking at the challenges faced by those who are supporting a family and at the same time working at a minimum wage job. At a time when companies are choosing to create 
more part-time and contract jobs, we'll be working to ensure those workers are treated fairly. And we'll be exploring how we can further support workers in an era where jobs don't last a lifetime anymore and sometimes fail to deliver even basic benefits. As a province, we are a leader in job creation and we're very proud of that. But the changing nature of work is leaving some people vulnerable. They're working contract to contract or they're otherwise dealing with an unstable or precarious work situation. They can be let go with no warning. As a result, some people can slip into poverty. Now, if that happens, what's the best way to help people manage or endure this uncertainty and give them the opportunity to succeed over the long term? Is it our current system of social assistance or is there a better way? For months, we, and I a shout out to um, Minister Helena Jasik of Community and Social Services and Minister Ballard who has responsibility for poverty reduction. They've been working and we've been working together doing the background work to explore the idea of a basic income. And today I'm pleased to announce the details of Ontario's basic income pilot that we'll be launching here in the Hamilton area and in two other Ontario communities, Lindsay and the Thunder Bay area. It's a great thing. And I think, I think we've got some folks from Thunder Bay and Lindsay here. Welcome. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for being here. It's great to have you here. The project will explore the effectiveness of providing a basic income to people who are currently living on low incomes whether they're working or not. And people participating in our pilot communities will receive a minimum amount of income each year, a basic income, no matter what. Je suis heureuse d'annoncer le plan de revenu de base de l'Ontario à Hamilton, l'une des communautés qui fera partie du projet pilote. Ce projet étudiera si un revenu de base pourrait accroître les opportunités et les perspectives d'emploi de ceux qui vivent avec un faible revenu, tout en assurant une plus grande sécurité pour eux et leur famille. It's not an extravagant sum by any means. For a single person, we're talking about just under $17,000 a year. But even that amount may make a real difference to someone who's striving to reach a better life. It says to them, government is with you. The people of Ontario are with you. We're here to help through the hard times as you get back on your feet. We're starting small, a three-year project in these selected communities to start. But our goal is clear. We want to find out whether a basic income makes a positive difference in people's lives, whether this new approach gives them the ability to begin to achieve their potential, and whether it's an approach that can be adopted across our province as a whole. So the finance minister will deliver our new budget in three days' time. A balanced budget will serve as a solid foundation and a starting point for what comes next. A balanced budget is not an end in itself. It will give us the ability to make choices. It will allow us the freedom to invest smartly and effectively in our people and our province. So you will see us investing in our priorities in health care, in education, and in those initiatives that make life more affordable for Ontario families. And in the months to follow, we'll build on that foundation. So yes, our economic indicators are positive and they're pointing in the right direction. And that's a good thing and that is important. And yes, we're confident in Ontario's ability to do even better in the future, better in Canada and better in the world. But we need to ensure that all Ontarians see themselves, their hopes and dreams reflected in the choices that we're making. We need to address the concerns of those who worry about falling behind, even as they work so hard to get ahead. And we need to create the kinds of opportunities that will allow that young woman that I met in Ottawa to feel confident about her future prospects. When I first stood in front of the people of Ontario as Premier, I was very clear that I believe that government can and must be a force for good. I believe that even more strongly today. With a clear, targeted, and responsible plan, we can make a positive difference in people's lives. 
And today, there's a place for government, a need for government to stand up play an active role building a fair society where there's more opportunity for everyone and more security too. This is no time to retreat. This is no time for government to cling to the status quo or to step away from its responsibilities. This is a time for us to be focused and fair, to be bold, to not simply describe and reassert our values, but to defend them and to act on them. This is the time to bring forward a clear plan that helps the most vulnerable and works for all. We can do this, but we can only do it together. So this is the time to work together toward a better way, a better life, and a better future right here in Ontario. Thank you so much. Merci. Thank you very much. And you can only imagine the hand wringing of my staff. She had a coughing fit. <laughs> but thank you very much. And so I'm, uh, I'm open to taking some questions from the audience at this point, from you folks. Yes. When you said there's, a, there's a mic coming oh, to you. Sorry. When you said uh, the, one of the uh, uh, pilot projects would be in Hamilton, did you mean all of Hamilton or just certain neighborhoods? So there will be, and the, the ministers might want to, uh, to speak to the details, but the way the project is being set up, it's being set up by researchers. And so um, there will be a, a process whereby I think people will apply and there will be criteria, but um, we're setting up a, a project that will be um, will give us the kind of evidence that we need, so it will be it will be um, as inclusive as it can be. And uh, we've chosen these communities intentionally because they are the right size and they have the right kind of mix of population. So, like right now in Hamilton, we have six thousand cases on Ontario Works. Right. We have a lot of people on disability with low income. So, Is so there it a won't cap to how many people here in Hamilton. Yes. So it will won't be, able be to it, in the three communities. It won't be every person who applies. We we won't be able to do that. There will be uh, there will be a, a limit to the number, but there will be an application process, and uh, and there will be criteria that will be very clear to people as they uh, as they apply. Yeah. Thanks very much for making this announcement in Hamilton today. I am uh, happy that we're going to be the, uh, the place of this pilot because I think that we have already been uh, building a space for uh, good conversation about the best way to roll it out and I think that we have enough people here that will be able to really give some good feedback on both sides and all sides about how it how it goes and you've and just i know you've got a question but i just want to jump in there because um the work that's been done on poverty reduction in hamilton and the collaborative uh, approach that has been taken here and ted has you know he has been pushing us and prodding us and showing us what's going on in hamilton for years and in fact we had great representative representation when we first set up our poverty reduction strategy in our committee we had great representation from Hamilton so this is a community that has done a lot of work in this area so you're right it is ripe for uh, for this pilot project Thanks. sorry I interrupted no, that's you fine. those are my favorite words you're right so um, <laughs> My name's Deirdre Pike. I'm with the Social Planning and Research Council here in Hamilton. So we've certainly been a part of this you work have. for a very long time. 50 years, in fact, is our anniversary this year. My question is, um, as, uh, as good as a movement this is about moving forward around basic income, uh, you know, the first time I met you was when we were talking about precarious employment. Yes. Uh, there has been obviously some good work done around jobs in Ontario, more to happen. But for the people who are languishing, on a single income for Ontario Works, can you please make a commitment to still do something more about those folks that this basic income maybe won't work for or they won't get on? 
Yes, so this is, a, this is a parallel track, and the minister has been very uh, clear about that. Helena Jask has been very clear that um, the, the basic income pilot is something that needs to be done. We need the research, but we also need to recognize that whether it's the rates or whether it's the assets that, uh, that people on social assistance, the opportunities that, uh, that they have, we need a parallel track that makes their lives better as well. So we have not forgotten that, and you will see that as we go forward. Okay. Here and then also here. Oh, we'll here come first? back to you. <laughs> Premier Ian Angus, Acting Mayor, City of Thunder Bay. Thank you for joining us, Ian. Well, thank you for the invitation, and more importantly, thank you on behalf of our community and our neighboring communities for picking us as one of the three pilots. We, we look forward to it. One of the things that pilots suggest is that there's going to be an evaluation. Right. And a lot of times, governments, when they do pilots and the pilot, and then think about it and do the evaluation over two or three or four years, and then they make a decision. Can you assure us that in this one, which is a three-year pilot, that the evaluation will be ongoing and that in the event that it proves what we all think it will prove, that an announcement will be made prior to the end of the three years of not only the continuation for those people who are on the pilot, but expansion? So. Let me just say that um, we will be doing evaluation as we uh, as we go along. Some of the uh, some of the outcomes from previous research, and um, you know, we, we're not going to not going to preempt the research that we're about to uh, do. But uh, you know, some of the outcomes about job retention, retention in education, better health outcomes, those are going to take a little bit of time to uh, to demonstrate if if we see those. And so that's why that's why three years. If we could figure figure it out in six months, we would figure it out in six months, Ian, but it takes a bit longer than that. So I can commit to you that we will, we will keep people posted about how it's going and what we think the, uh, the plans are going forward. And you're right, before the end of the three years, we'll have, a, we'll have a pretty good idea of where it's going and we'll be able to talk about what comes next. Okay. Yeah, um, I just have a question to ask. Um, in your study, it's good to talk about basic income and it's good news. My concern is um, those on the pilot project um, on OW, uh, ODSP, um, are those benefits going to be cut? So the, the objective of this pilot is that nobody's going to be worse off as a result of going on to the pilot. So, um, you know, whatever, um, whatever in terms of supports you have in place, whether you're on social assistance or not, you're not going to be worse off if you go into the pilot. Um, what about the, the job plan? Um, jo the job plan? The Oh, the drug plan. That's what I mean. You won't be worse off if you go on to the pilot. And that, you know, that was a big discussion, obviously, in the design of the, uh, of the program. And I know that it's a challenging piece, but um, that, is, that is the principle that uh, if you come on to the basic income pilot, you're not going to be worse off than you were before. Okay? Good morning, Cheryl Antosky, Acting Mayor for City of Brantford. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even acknowledge you. Well, Great and, to have and you here. I, we're, we're very grateful to be part of this project as well. How are we going to be rolling out the education uh, piece of this? There's still a lot of misunderstanding. There's fear. There's how do we get the message out that that this is beneficial for all of us, not just those who will be re recipients of. So that's a really good point. And we're, this is just the start of that. And the two ministers will be, uh, they'll be engaging in a, a public education campaign about this as we, <clears throat> as we roll into the application process. Um, but the point you made about uh, this is beneficial for all of us. One of the, one of the really um, uh, important questions that we have to ask of the research is what is the impact on the whole community not just on the individuals or the families who are in the pilot but what happens to their extended family what happens to their community and neighborhood and so we'll be looking very much at those uh, at those issues and as I said today is the start of that process and remember We've been talking about this as a society for 30 years or more. Hugh Siegel, who helped us to design this, uh, this pilot, literally has been talking about this for 30 years as something that needs to be tried. And so, as I said in my remarks, 
you know, this may not be the best time. Maybe 30 years ago was the best time, but this is the time we're living in. And this is the, this is the context where we are seeing anxiety and uncertainty. And so that's why we're going to start right now. Uh, Lisa Simon, Associate Medical Officer of Health in Simcoe Muskoka. Thank you very much for this very exciting announcement, which will do, um, which will have great benefit. I, I strongly anticipate for the health of Ontarians. Um, my question is, uh, what role do you envision for the government versus for external organizations and agencies in terms of uh, both researching or evaluating the pilot and also overseeing it from sort of a community and civil society perspective? So I can answer the second better than I can answer the first, and I don't know in terms of the research. There will be a research model set up, and but I, I would say to you that the, um, the role is complete partnership. I mean, we are going to be working very much in partnership with community agencies because that's the only way that this will work, and we know that. Um, you know, whenever we have a discussion about poverty reduction and, and that back to my point about how much work has been done here in Hamilton, government can put the framework in place, government can provide resources, but the interaction between people in communities is not between them and the legislature, it's between them and community agencies, them and their local governments. So it's going to be a very tight partnership and we're looking to, uh, we're looking to those community agencies to work with us. And to work with each other, can I say? <laughs> yeah. There's a woman here. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lena Sharma Seth. I work with the Halton Poverty Roundtable. Um, the question I had is so I'm assuming it's a voluntary application process. Um, how will you assure the diversity in terms of representation? Because I know that there, everyone might not be aware of the opportunity. So I was just curious how you were going to make sure that everyone who needs to know about it knows about it. Well, again, I, I'm not the technician or the researcher, but um, we are relying on people who have very strong backgrounds and academic backgrounds in setting up uh, uh, this kind of, of, uh, of research project. And so those are, those are criteria that will very much be part of the design. Okay. I think, you know, I think the challenge we're going to have is that there's going to be a huge um, group of people who are going to want to take part. And it's, uh, so those criteria will be very important. Thank you. I have a throat thing too. Okay. I'm Sheila Riguer. I'm the chair of the Basic Income Canada Network. Oh, so we're welcome. looking at this nationally and I've <coughs> been approached by filmmakers from the BBC and from the United States. There is so much focus on what Ontario is doing and so much hope. So we're really happy about this. One of the questions I have um, is, I mean, the pilot will unfold. I crave details, but th this is not the day for that. The pilot will unfold and the participants will do their thing and the evaluation will run and that sort of thing. What concerns me a little bit, and I think it's a role for our organization, but for government as well, is that there are a lot of people who really still do not understand this idea, yeah. what it's about, why we're doing it, how important it is. Yeah. So are there plans to sort of continue the public education Absolutely. writ large? Absolutely. And I, I really believe that some of, the, some of the things I said about the current anxiety in the current climate in our, uh, in our society actually lend themselves to people wanting to understand, like, what is it that we can do to make things better? And so I think that is a good entree into, uh, into that conversation. So yes, we will be doing everything in our power to um, continue the public education. Or as I, you know, as I just said, I think we're beginning the public education right now because um, for the most part, unless you were part of the process in Manitoba or you, you're an academic, you haven't really studied what basic income means. Why should, why should you have? And so we will, we will be doing everything we can to make it clear to people why we're doing this, what it actually means. Okay. Hello, We have Ted. time for one more question, but just before we do that, I... I've spotted a couple people that uh, should introduce uh, Bob Bertina, the M oh, MP, hi, Bob. is here. <laughs> nice to see you. And, and my good friend Tom Cooper from the Hamilton Roundtable on poverty. Nice to see you. Is there anybody else I missed? 
not that I did. Well, I miss anybody. Else? Everybody here is important. We yes. couldn't, can't introduce everybody, but one more question, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rick Weaver. I'm a city councilor for the city of Brantford. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to just confirm that Brantford is, in fact, uh, part of the pilot, and um, we'll yes. be able to roll that out to our citizens as well. Yes, and I apologize. I should have spread that why It's the Hamilton and Brantford region, so I apologize, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Merci. <laughs> This is an important day in Ontario and uh, who knows where else. Uh, and uh, it's uh, all totally fit, fitting that it be here in Hamilton. Would you agree, Mr. Mayor? And uh, so uh, I just want to take a minute to thank uh, the two ministers who have been driving this and of course the Premier who's, uh, whose courageous leadership on all fronts is, uh, is just something to behold. Uh, uh, Premier, thank you for coming into my beloved city and sharing this uh, very, very important uh, uh, news. Um, you know, Mum used to say, you've heard me say this before, there are two kinds of people in this world, those that make a noise and those that make a difference. Uh, you're a difference maker, as are your cabinet colleagues here. And <laughs> And as we sojourn, uh, it's been a long and winding road that's got, gotten us to this place. As we continue our sojourn, um, we do so with a, a sense of thanksgiving and gratefulness for your leadership. And uh, I have the privilege of serving as your parliamentary assistant, so I get it. Uh, I get the leadership close up. Uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, and for this initiative. It's a, it's a difference maker. It's a game changer for sure. I think, right? All the best. Thanks, Premier.